please. So our next speaker is Tyler Pruitt from SpectraCal and Portrait Displays. You may have seen them at various shows. Uh, they sell uh, calibration instruments and software. Um, he works for, spe for a SpectraCal where he develops test methods for evaluation and calibration of all types of display technologies. But his main focus lately has been on HDR, which of course is a very hot button issue. Um, for his company's HDR efforts, he was involved in development of calibration methods and Kalman workflows. Kalman is their software for Dolby Vision, HDR10, and hybrid log gamma. He was a co-author of a paper published by SID this year on the complexities of metrology, metrology for HDR displays and also co-authored a paper last year characterizing, characterizing high dynamic range display system properties in the context of today's flexible ecosystems. Boy, say that five times fast. So please give a warm welcome to Tyler Pruitt of SpectraCal Portrait Displays. Thank you, Pete. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow a guy from NASA, but I'll try. <clears throat> what I'm talking about today is a new proposal for not only a characterization file format, but a whole new radical new process for calibrating HDR um, home theater displays, televisions, and in theory, projectors. So first I want to get into a little bit of the background and motivation of why this is even needed. Um, mastering HD content is pretty simple. You have a display and the consumer display almost always can produce the same uh, visual performance. And in most cases it has more performance than the HD mastering display. So when we calibrate an HD TV, we are essentially detuning it slightly so it uh, follows the standards of the BT1886 EOTF, electro-optical transfer function or gamma curve, uh, D65, the BT709 color gamut. Now this process is very mature. Um, the calibration companies and industries and calibrators and the TV manufacturers and even TV reviewers have been responsible for pushing forward for uh, us to get accurate controls that actually do what they say uh, for calibration-wise in televisions. And this is a very mature process. It's very well known and you just calibrate to the correct EOTF and to the 709 primaries and make sure it's D65 and then you preserve the creative intent. Now obviously not everybody does this but you know, people that really care and are real enthusiasts on their content and the biggest fans of content like to have their displays calibrated. When we talk about HDR mastering, now we have a situation where <clears throat> the mastering displays have higher performance in almost all cases than the HDR consumer TVs. Um, for example, there's three main mastering displays right now that are being used. There's more in the pipeline, um, but one is the Dolby Pulsar at 4,000 nits, the Sony X300 is 1,000 nits, the Canon uh, 2420 is 1,000 nits, and they all pretty much cover 100% of P3 color space. Now, we have a vast display performance delta from the highest end TVs to the lowest end TVs that still process HDR content. So something like a 600 nit LCD that maybe only does 90% of P3 has to do significant color volume remapping. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to Pat from Dolby for coming up with the word color volume. Um, it needs to remap the content to preserve creative intent on that display device. And there's different ways of doing that, and um, I'll go into that a little bit. The first one is using static metadata with the content. Now, this is the ST2086 static metadata from SMPTE, and on paper it sounds like a good idea, but it really only tells you, hey, what's the brightest pixel in this whole movie? And we could have a super dark movie, like the Blair Witch Project or something similar to that, where it, it's completely dark and maybe it has one explosion or the end is, it has a bright scene. And the metadata would say that it's max CLL or it's max light level is maybe a thousand nits, but maybe the whole, whole movie wasn't even close to that. So if the TV is looking at that metadata, it might 
sacrifice the accuracy of 99% of the movie in order to preserve that one explosion or highlight at the end. Now, for uh, there is no uh, there is no standard or even recommendation on how you're supposed to do this. So this is an actual display I measured, one where I sent it metadata with my test patterns of 1,000 nits mastering display, the other 4,000 nits, and as you can see, uh, the, the 4,000 nit content does not follow ST2084. It's a little bit under, and then it has its roll off, but like I said, none of that roll off or that behavior is standardized. So. The next way you could do this is with, with dynamic metadata, Dolby Vision, Philips Technicolor, or Samsung's HDR10+, Plus, where the TV, instead of just looking at one piece of metadata for the whole movie, actually either has frame by frame uh, or um, frame by frame or scene by scene metadata that says how bright is this scene or frame and what is the average and what is the minimum of this frame. And the TV doesn't have to have a lot of extra horsepower because it doesn't need to calculate any of this stuff. It just needs to um, look at the metadata and adjust its color volume transform. The third one that's becoming very popular, especially in the high-end uh, HDR televisions, is the manufacturers realized this just looking at the static HDR10 metadata that it wasn't optimal to tone map based on one, one piece of information. So the, the, the highest end TVs are now, instead of looking at the static metadata, they're actually real time analyzing the frames. Because as TVs are getting more and more powerful and they have way more interactive uh, functionality, they have much more powerful GPUs and CPUs and they can write shaders and stuff like that to actually analyze each frame as it comes in and adjust their tone mapping or color volume mapping based on that. But that does require uh, more horsepower, so the lowest end TVs that most people are buying um, aren't included in that. And there was, uh, I was recently a part of a talk um, at a summit and a guy from NPD talked about only 8% of televisions, people spend more than $1,000. So 92% of people are spending under $1,000. So the, the, most of your content is gonna be seen on these lower end TVs. So we need to figure out how to make those uh, more accurate. So with, with that little background and, and how, the, how, the dy how these TVs have dynamic behavior with HDR content, and even test, they have dynamic behavior with test patterns. So how do we calibrate this? Um, so if, if, if the goal is to calibrate it, and our only standard is ST2084 curve, there's no standard for how it's going to roll off at the top. Um, we don't want, as a calibrator, or as a calibration company, to interfere with the behavior that each manufacturer thinks and their picture quality teams have spent a lot of money and resources designing algorithms to properly display this content. We don't want to go and throw a wrench into that during calibration. So we don't want to take this tone map that, that they tested and they approved and they think that they have the best technology for tone mapping. Um, we don't want to interfere with that with calibration. So I've made this simplified HDR TV video pipeline, and uh, the, the green or the teal color is where the color volume remapping would happen. Now, it, it, it might be done in a 3D lookup table. It might be done with a combination of 1D lookup table and 3D, or 1D and 3 by 3 matrix, or some combination of everything. But I've just kind of labeled it color volume remapping is happening here. Now, all of that happens upstream of our calibration controls. So we have no control over that, that color volume remapping. And if we start adjusting stuff after that happens, then we're essentially deviating from the, the, what the picture quality engineers at the TV manufacturers have decided is the correct tone map. If we start poking around with calibration controls downstream of that, then we essentially break what, what they're doing. So what I'm presenting here and proposing is a new way to do calibration for HDR TVs, and the, the, the big thing is what I'm calling uh, HDR bypass mode. So the way this would work is 
during calibration, we would bypass all the, the color volume remapping. And I should have probably mentioned this earlier, but all TVs are still based on gamma. Even if they're HDR, at the panel level, they're still a gamma curve native panel. So the, they not only need to do this uh, remapping of content, but they also have to convert from the HDR EOTF to the native panel gamma curve. So with this process, we would disable all the HDR mapping and the conversion to gamma. So we would just be able to measure the panel in its HDR mode, but it would just give its native gamma response. And once we, calc once we can then calibrate, um, so we need to enable this HDR uh, uh, bypass mode. So my ideas are it could be a special set of out of range static metadata that would never actually be in content and that would signal to the TV, hey, I'm trying to, be, I'm trying to calibrate you, turn off all your HDR mapping. Another could be a button combination on the remote via IR, it could be in the TV OSD menu, it could be a menu option called like HDR calibration mode. Um, or it could be programmatically via TV API that calibration software like ours or other people's could access. But once we've disabled all that, we can calibrate just the panel to its native gamma curve, and whether that be 2.2 or 2.4, most likely it's 2.2, because all of that color volume remapping processing is assuming that the panel has a perfect native gamma response. And we know just because uh, TVs have to be made at a decent price, they can't actually um, hand calibrate each one or else it would cost as much as a reference monitor probably. Um, so once we know that we're bypassing everything, we can calibrate to a perfect gamma curve and then all of the color volume processing will happen as exact as the manufacturer intended. We don't want to um, stifle any innovation in that because there is a lot of innovation happening in, in color volume remapping. Um, each manufacturer is putting a lot of money into it. And I, I'm sure eventually, maybe in five years, there'll be a SMPTE standard for it because they'll kind of coalesce around the perfect way to do it, but we're not there yet. So the second part of this process, after you've calibrated your panel to perfect native gamma with all the color uh, volume remapping turned off, uh, is what I call the color volume profile. And what this is, um, is we would measure the native primaries of the display and also measure the display's peak brightness or peak white um, and peak, uh, minimum black level. Because these algorithms that they're using for color volume remapping already have this data in the TV because they have to know what they're uh, what they're mapping onto, but most likely it's just a generic average of a whole lot of panels or they, they grabbed a couple TVs off the line and measured them and came up with uh, an average. So since we don't, since that is just an average, you could have a TV that was brighter or dimmer and both of them wouldn't be optimized. So you'd probably get better performance out of the higher one if you did this, and you would get more accurate performance out of the lower end one than just an average of the two. So after we've characterized the native gamut and the, the peak luminance and the black level, we could write it to either a file. This is an example that I just made in text edit. Uh, it would be the X, Y primaries for red, green, and blue, and um, the peak luminance and the minimum luminance in nits and that would tell the TV exactly what its own performance is. So how do we get this data back into the TV? So it, uh, it could be via a text file loaded on a USB drive, because almost every TV these days has a USB interface. Or it could be entered into the OSD menu systems. Um, example, uh, Joe Kane's Samsung projector had this feature where you would, you would calibrate it like a digital cinema projector where you would measure the primaries and feed it back in the projector and since the DLP is super linear, it would just do everything correctly. So it could be in the OSD menus or it could be, like I said previous, programmatically via an API to calibration software. So my conclusion is we need a way to calibrate these TVs without, um, without limiting the, the color volume remapping innovation that these TV manufacturers and 
there are indeed departments. There's a lot of brilliant color scientists in there, and we don't want the people that are calibrating to throw a wrench into what they've came up with. Um, so I did want to acknowledge uh, a couple people, Timo Kunkel from Dolby Laboratories and Neil Robinson from LG Electronics. Now this talk is, I consider it a follow-up uh, to my talk that I did at NAB in the SMPT Future of Cinema Conference where I talked about a very similar process that was developed in partnership with these uh, two companies to calibrate Dolby Vision. And uh, my, my proposal here is to, let's do it for HDR10 and HLG as well. So um, that's it, and that's my talk. And if you have any questions, please ask. I have a, I have a couple of questions, actually, just to kick things off. Um, you mentioned that uh, the manufacturers, and I, I did travel to uh, Korea this summer and visit LG Display's phenomenal facility in Paju, uh, Korea, where they have enormous buildings that are five and six stories tall with 20 people running everything, and they're cranking out thousands of panels a day. But have you um, just off the top of your head or even tested the delta between, let's say, four or five different TVs of the exact same brand and everything? How much of a shift do you see uh, between the uh, performance? Um. Let's see, how can I be <laughs> diplomatic? Um, there, there is a, a, a decent difference, especially in OLED. Um, there can be, you know, maybe 50 nits difference or even more between the best panel and the, and the least. 50, five zero? Yes. Five zero. Um, but I think th I've seen the chromaticity go, go around. But I, I'm, I think there is a lot of variability. Um, also, if we're talking about three years from now, what is the panel brightness? You should be able to, because it's still going to have that factory configuration that says, oh, I'm 650 nits or something. And maybe in, in five years, it won't be anymore. And you'll be able to update that profile. And I think that's a, a good goal. Well, that's, again, with OLEDs um, in general, I don't want to take on a particular manufacturer, but it's well known that blue is a color that ages faster than any other color. And the white OLED that's actually used by LG is a combination of both yellow and blue. And I did ask the question when I was there, have you measured the degradation of blue versus yellow over time? And not that I'm surprised, but the answer came back immediately. It's got to be at least 20,000 hours, which I think is an off-the-shelf answer that you get. But I think it's valid to do that. Um, and I guess my question is that by doing this, um, do you undo any of the enhancements that the manufacturers make I mean, how does it benefit the panel necessarily that you, you feed back in and say, well, this is the limits of what the panel can do? Um, does that interfere with anything that, you know, things like black stretch or trying to kick the whites up? Or um, So speaking of the, the integration we did with Dolby and LG on their LG OLEDs is no because of the fact that it's sanctioned by them. And that's why I'm really proposing this at SMPT to try to get all the manufacturers on board to work together on on this instead of having um, it just be the Wild West. Um, a lot of TV reviewers use our software, so the, the, um, the, the manufacturers are actually pretty, um, they know that those results are going to be published, and that helps them decide. It, really, the whole TV reviewers doing objective measurements has really pushed the picture quality forward because, you know, you could just have subjective, yeah, it looks better, but what does that mean? But the TV reviewers are, very, are getting very analytical, and they are publishing calibration and measurement results of the TVs, and so I think that's pushing things forward. So I think that's why the TV manufacturers are actually very willing to, to interact with us and other manufacturers that make calibration equipment. In the interest of making it better. Yes. All right, well, I see Peter Simon is queued up, and I'm sure he has a good question. <laughs> okay, two things frightened me in what you were saying. One was where you talked about the TV receiver doing adaptive frame by frame, and it would seem to me that that's just designed to totally destroy any mood that might have been in the creative uh, d decisions made on the product. Uh, the, the other thing, and I'll just leave you to comment as you wish, is I'm also very concerned that the, a lot of the innovation that goes into the processing can sometimes be more concerned with making it look, look in the, good in the showroom 
uh, than looking, making it look good in the living room or the home theater. I just appreciate your comments. So one thing the manufacturers have done is, yeah, they have their vivid mode. They even have HDR vivid mode, but they have given us good, accurate modes. Um, a, uh, Sony and LG have something called Cinema Home, which is a bright, overall brighter HDR than just trying to be as accurate as possible. And that is because there has been kind of this backlash from consumers that they think HDR is dim because they watch their SDR at 300 nits. So a lot of these manufacturers have had to add HDR bright room modes. Um, just, I, I think that was a, a well-founded um, question, but the manufacturers, like I said, a lot hangs on what these re online reviews say. Maybe it isn't to the, to the normal consumer, but to the people that buy the expensive high-end sets, they read reviews, and accuracy is one of the big things that the TV reviewers judge these displays on. Um, and that's why I think it, it actually is important. Um, with regards to processing and color volume remapping, um, when you have a mastering display that was 100% of P3 and 1,000 nits, you have to do something or else you would just clip. And a lot of the manufacturers have actually bought X300s and actually used that, play the content on the X300 and, and tune their color volume remapping algorithms to best preserve and make it look visually the same as possible with these algorithms. So their goal is accuracy, not to make it look like vivid mode or something. Okay, we have another question. Gearling IoT. Uh, <clears throat> one question about the um, precision of your measurement. You showed us a precision with, I think, six or seven decimal uh, values behind the decimal point. I don't believe that this is really measurable at first. And second, um, this is not visible in, in the image itself if the difference in the seventh uh, value behind the decimal points come up. On the other hand, um, you mentioned that you want from the manufacturer, display manufacturer, that they have, uh, that you have the possibility to measure the original uh, gamma curve. Uh, this was in the past the case, as you have uh, CRTs for let's say 20 years or 30 years ago, it was possible. But nowadays with the uh, high integrated uh, circuits, I think it is not possible anymore. And you get not really a primary out of the uh, display. It will always be uh, via um, a color mapping to bring the display exact of the point of the, yeah, uh, primary. Well, that, that's why I want this HDR bypass mode where they put it into, because no. th most of the time vivid mode, they just turn off, most of these uh, color management things are done with the three by three matrix and they just put it to unity and give you the pa panel native for vivid mode and I'm just asking, let's do that for this HDR bypass mode. Just put your three by three matrix that controls the color gamut into Unity and let's measure what the actual primaries are. And when we feed back that data in, then you can calculate your new three by three matrix off the actual measured data instead of whatever average you decided was average of all the panels. I would be happy if it is, would be the cause, but I'm sure it would, be, it would not be. <laughs> we have a booth, so if you want to come and talk, I would love to talk more about that in, in detail. All right, I have one last question. And every time I've asked this to a TD manufacturer, I get this blank stare. Can we get rid of the dynamic setting in pictures and televisions? I mean, this is HDR content. Why do we need a dynamic setting? I know that in the old days, it was to set it there, to put it on the showroom, because people are drawn to the brightest TV. But if you're showing content on a showroom that has lots of high brightness, specular highlight content, why do you need a dynamic setting? And Especially now, all the TVs, if you go to set it up, it asks you, are you in store mode or home mode? So why do we need vivid mode for home? And unless somebody, maybe, I can see from their point of view, somebody's like, hey, it doesn't look like it did at the store. I want my money back. So 
maybe it should be there, but maybe it shouldn't even be close to the default, and they should default to maybe a brighter but accurate mode. And I think that's what they're doing. When I talked about people saying HDR is too dim, that's why all the manufacturers now have an HDR bright mode. It still maintains the correct white point. It just makes the overall picture brighter for people that either have a larger or a large room that's really bright or they watch their SDR um, too bright. I'm reminded of those commercials where they say brighter, cleaner, and smells lemony. Well, thank you very much, to Tyler. Um, great topic. <laughs>